Tonight's speaker, Vita Wade, is an ocean advocate from the Caribbean island of Montserrat. She partners with scientific and local communities to identify sustainable and equitable solutions for ocean conservation. Vita and her family were forced to flee her island when a volcano erupted in 1995. In the years that followed, Montserrat's communities and coral reefs began the road to recovery. When Vita returned to her island as an adult, she realized that several barriers were contributing to poor management practices, including a prevalent fear of the sea and of swimming. She resolved to serve as a bridge between her people and the sea to help people better understand the importance and benefits of the ocean. With an educational background in management studies, Vita founded Fish and Fins in 2011, a nonprofit organization that provides more than 2,000 youth across the Caribbean with opportunities to learn about local marine life and ocean safety. She is working to establish a Fish and Fins Youth Committee on every Caribbean island to foster the sustainable use of ocean resources and to ensure that at least half of all Caribbean children can swim by 2030. Vita's pioneering work brings her into contact with schools and local communities on Montserrat, as well as on other Caribbean islands. Extending beyond the Caribbean, she has established long-term partnerships with major organizations and institutions, such as the Waite Institute, Brown University, and Google's Moonshot Factory. In 2019, she was named Montserrat Ocean Ambassador and is an appointed council member for Montserrat's Conservation and Environmental Management Act. Recognized as a leader on marine conservation issues, Vita is currently enrolled in the United Nations Ocean Decade Early Career Ocean Program with a focus on the deep sea ocean strategy. Vita's work is doing wonders to ignite a curiosity through science, learning, and exploration that in turn advances a more equitable and resilient Caribbean blue economy and contributes to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 14 to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, seas, and marine resources for sustainable development. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Vita up to the podium. Um, I, it's my pleasure to be here tonight. And um, I just want to thank the New England Aquarium and Dr. Ayanna Johnson for recommending me for this talk. Um, before I start, I just want to give you a sense of place as to where Montserrat is and a little bit of our program, Fish and Fins, in action. So just have a quick look at this very short video. My name is Vita Wade. I was born on the tiny island of Montserrat. Living on an island, the ocean is, of course, very special to me. Fish and Fins is a kids' club that I started to get the children of Montserrat engaged with the sea. We teach them how to snorkel, how to swim, and really to just understand what's happening in the oceans around them. People protect what they love. Our mission at Fish and Fins is to inspire awareness and respect for our ocean. We are creating a generation of ocean leaders that will do the right things to preserve and protect our ocean's future. Okay, so that's Montserrat. That's where I'm from. And that's why I bring you greetings this evening from the people of Montserrat, as well as from our friends and crew at Fish and Fins. Now Montserrat is a little tiny island in the middle of the Caribbean Sea. It's a British territory and it is home to just about 4,500 people. I'm here because I really wanted to share with you my journey into ocean conservation so that you can get an insight as to what we in the Caribbean are doing to really support our sustainable development goals this ocean decade. We're taking action for the ocean for this period, 2021 to 2030. I also want to share with you an idea. It's an idea that I call smarter tourism, and it's how we're going to leverage technology, smart technology with tourism to accelerate the sustainable development goals for this decade. For those of you who are not familiar with the sustainable development goals, I wanted to say, share this with you. We have, it's known as the 17 Global Goals, 
And there is a universal call to see that we eradicate poverty, we protect our ocean, and we also ensure that our people can live in peace as well as prosperity. Now, the theme for the ocean decade is the science we need for the ocean we want. And I suppose if there is one thing that I want you all to leave here with tonight is to realize that no matter who we are, what we have, the resources we have, where we come from, whether or not it's a small island or a big city state, we all have a part to play to help protect our ocean this decade. Now, before I go into a little bit about myself, I wanted to give you a little bit more context about Montserrat. As I said, we are home to 4,500 pe people. Um, I, you, you would have heard that we had an active volcano. So before the volcano started, we had about 10,000 people in our population. When the volcano became active, our population dropped to 2,000. Now we're at 4,005 again. We have about 20 to 40% live coral cover, five species of marine life that are critically endangered, 10 that are endangered, and lots and lots of small fish. Monstrous challenges are to do with its size and its volcano. So over the last 25 years of volcanic activity, we have seen an aging population, lack of economic progress, migrating youth, and the public health care, education, and cultural heritage that are also endangered. Now, so in, 20, in 1995, this was a view from my home in the village of Salem, and I was immersed in nature at this point as a little girl growing up in the Caribbean. But by 1997, my life would change drastically. That's a picture of me on the right, on the left, as a little girl, back then, life was good. I was on my new bicycle and it was a birthday party, my birthday party. In the, in the middle, there's my dad, Arthur Mead, and he is my environmental hero. This is a man that taught me how to appreciate our environment. And also, he instilled in me a very keen patriotism for my country. In fact, at home, I would say national pride is next to environmental pride. And on the far right, there is me in very bad fashion sense with a top hat looking carpet on my head because I was so, f so freezing in the UK and desperately missing my island. This is my dad. He spent his whole life more or less being a tour guide. In this photograph, he's here with a number of visitors to the island in our Sufre Hills volcano before it became active. So by 2011, I decided to re return home to be a part of the redevelopment of my island. I returned home to work for the Department of Tourism and I was in the culture division. But meanwhile, I used to sit in my office, look out the window, see the fishermen going up the road and thinking, God, that could be me. So I started this small business called Aqua Montserrat, which was an eco tour business. And I also started a community snorkel club. I invited visitors to come to, to our island to experience our products. And they came. In this photo, they came from Russia, they came from Serbia, they came from France, Spain, most recently, Australia, and all over the world. It was successful. Our fishers, my fisher friend here, Jabib, otherwise known as David, helped me. I rallied the fishermen to support us in volunteering their time to educating people about coral reefs and our coral reef health. They would run guided underwater tours, and in return, I would pay them. By this time, sometimes we would do fish, grill fish on the beach and have our visitors and our volunteers experience this. This was a new type of tourism that was sort of like an eco, a hybrid between ecotourism and community tourism. It became 
very unique across the Caribbean islands and very different compared to what you would see in some of the bigger, more commercial tourism islands. Now, it became so unique, in fact, that the Caribbean Tourism Organization recognized the product, recognized Aqua Montserrat and myself, and by 2017, I was named Montserrat's Adventure Tourism Ambassador. By 2015, I was determined to share with our community what I was seeing with local fishermen under the sea. I was determined to get our children up close to coral reefs and to be able to learn to swim. Now, I was lucky in a sense because at this time, the Weight Institute came to do a program in the, on, on the island called the Blue Halo Program. It was for marine spatial planning. So I wrote a two-page letter to that company, which is an international NGO, and said, I don't really need your money. I just want to have equipment and some scientific support. At the time, the Weight Institute was, was led by Ayanna E. Johnson. And quickly, they agreed, and they sent us enough equipment so that that summer and every summer after, we would be able to introduce over 75 children to the sea. By, by the next, over the, over the duration of the next few years, every year we would introduce about 200 children to the sea, and 98% of the children had never seen a coral reef before. I myself grew up on the islands not knowing how to swim or even recognizing that coral reef were animals in our backyard. This is a picture of myself and Stephanie Roach at the time, who is now Stephanie Tate of the Ocean Agency. She was part of the team that helped to breathe air and life into the Fish and Fins program at Little Bay, Montserrat. So by 20, it was 2016 or so, I was a new parent and I had Ezra who is here with us tonight. I was a woman on a mission to get our children water safe and to also learn to identify coral, be able to get up close to the marine environment and understand the global issues that would affect the well-being of our future generation going forward. So this is where it all began. I didn't have any resources. I had nothing. I didn't really have all the right skills in education. But what I had was the will to be part of the redevelopment of my island. I had within me the passion to make a difference. I loved seawater and that was pretty much it. There's a photograph of Ezra, two years old, pretty much in tow with me all the way through. Here is a photograph of Rootsman, AKA Murphy. Murphy is an elder in the community who is a Presbyterian, so he eats only fish. I encouraged people like Murphy to teach the children about traditional fishing practices and how the ocean was linked to our lives and our livelihoods. On the left here, we have Uncle Fred. On the right, we have Jabim or Beamish again, showing the children some of these traditional practices like shore fishing and seine fishing. Murphy here, seen on the left, would show the children how he would make a, a raft go on the water with his fishnet, catch his fish, and sh he would also show them how to prepare it in very indigenous ways and methods. On the left here again is Uncle Fred on the roadside selling his fish. On the right, Arnold. Arnold is a great friend of mine. He actually spent a lot of time with me when I first returned home. He taught me how to free dive, and I spent a lot of time with him just really exploring Montserrat. Arnold, I think, is one of the true scientists of the sea, but Arnold is also a turtle hunter. So what I did was I set out an ambition to encourage Arnold by emp empowering him and providing him employment in Aqua Monstra tours as a reef tour guide so that he could see that turtles were worth more money alive than the meat could ever catch on the market. I wanted to show Arnold that conservation pays, ocean stewardship pays. Now around this time, 
I'm not sure how many of you know about lionfish, but lionfish is also a threat to the Caribbean. It's an invasive species, so there's no known predator in Montserrat or in the Caribbean waters. Left unmanaged, an adult lionfish could nest up to 40,000 eggs and could become a major threat to the marine ecosystem. Sufficiently so, because of their vor voracious appetite, they would basically swallow up all of the commercially significant and culturally significant fish. Things like the red snapper, the hind, the butterfish, things like people in my community really like to eat. Now, lionfish, one of the sustainable whales, ways of managing it is by eating it, is by spearfishing it. In the Caribbean, we say we're going to eat them to beat them. Here you can see one of the local fishers showing the children of fish and fins who are surfacing at the top how to actually catch lionfish. Shortly after, some of the children became very good at catching their own lionfish. Here you can see Matthew, who was particularly outstanding at this. On the other side is Abigail. And Abigail used to be so passionate Every time she went out on one of these adventure trips, she would run back to the clubhouse, get a fish identification book, and try to learn every single fish species that she saw. Matthew is here being recognized at one of our camps, our science camps, by the one and only DJ Turtle for his prized lionfish catch. On the left here is Abigail and her twin sister, Shade, and both of these young girls learned to swim, snorkel, and get involved with marine science at Fish and Fins, I'm proud to say. Denari, on your right, was an intern at Fish and Fins. And here is Denari in the Little Bay area, which is the home of Fish and Fins, where he actually dived up a whole bag of marine debris. As you can see, they were getting up close to the issues that were plaguing our island. Now, me being a bit of a nerd, I would take the girls of Fish and Fins, what I would call the Fish and Fins mermaid, to local high-level talks with, the, with regional leaders. So these are things like the, oversee, the organization of the Eastern Caribbean states, for those of us who are familiar with the Caribbean. It's a regional body of um, high-level leaders. And they would have discussions around climate change, marine pollution, and coral health. I wanted the girls to see how what they were seeing and learning in the water actually tied right back by connecting the dots to our policies. I wanted them to realize that if there was ever a time for us to shout 1.5 to stay alive in the Caribbean, it is now. And I say that because, I say that really because it's a very difficult situation right now for us in the Caribbean. The Sustainable Development Goals, Life Below Water, number 14, is only funding one, funded by 1% of all the Sustainable Development Goals. And currently, Life Below Water is not meeting its 2013 goals. It's time for us to act urgently and I wanted to really say to you as well that one of the things that I've experienced in this journey is that when you're in a small island like my own, two of the most challenging situations, when you're faced with a climate crisis and a threat to your livelihood and your home is the lack of political will and also the lack of a viable, a viable private sector. So you could imagine doing work like my own, like my work is incredibly challenging. And sometimes the frustration and the trauma could be so difficult that you just want to pack your bags and leave. But I have hope and I have hope because of the fact that I believe that though the ocean is threatened, it could provide enormous opportunities for our people and our community. So I wanted to, to share with you as well from my lens and my experience back home what some of the threats to ocean health really are as far as we're seeing. 
we're hearing globally that marine plastics, um, climate, of course, and we're hearing that overfishing are all challenging, and this is true. But I wanted to give you a closer view into what motivates me to do this work sufficiently enough to come to speak to you tonight. I mentioned the lion fish before, and I'm showing you a photograph that we've taken in the reefs in my backyard. Sagassum seaweed is also a threat to our ocean health, where I come from. Now, the Sagassum seaweed, this golden carpet of seaweed that some scientists believe the overgrowth of the Sagassum from Sagassum Sea is actually being caused by climate change. Whatever the reason for it, since 2011, our shores have been inundated with Sagassum. You could imagine for some of the islands in the Caribbean that are some of the most tourism dependent islands in the world, having Sagassum wash up on your shores is no easy plight. Now, the problem with this is that when the Sagassum sinks to the bottom of the sea, it smothers the fish pots. And we don't know what the effect is happening in the near shore, in the coral reef, or even the deep sea, because we don't have the eyes to know or the access to the resources to explore. This is a photograph of the Sagassum seaweed inundation on the northeastern coast of Montserrat. Another challenge is species and habitat conservation. Here you see a photograph of Ezra. And Ezra, this was the first time that he saw the effects of a turtle nesting chamber that had been flooded or washed away by surging seas. As we know, with a climate crisis, we're expecting rougher seas and stormier weather to hit the regions. Now, combine that for a moment with the threat of rising sea levels. Imagine the impact this will have on the communities along our coastlines, as well as the creature, the marine animals that rely on this for their home and habitat. Now, what's also interesting is that since the 1980s, turtle conservation has been happening in Montserrat, but Montserrat still does not have the capacity to actually manage scientifically turtle conservation on the island on its own. I think that's important to consider, considering the fact that we have, we are home to some of the most beautiful and endangered green, hawksbill, and loggerhead turtles. Small scale fisheries is also an ever present challenge because we have to protect our food supply. And it is important in this decade to ensure that we modernize and digitalize small scale fisheries and that we pay a closer attention on creating alternative livelihood opportunities for friends of mine, as well as the fishermen that create much needed healthy food stock to our island. Now, that being said, I believe in a bluer future. And the good news is that we have an incredible amount of young, passionate people on Montserrat who want to learn more. They want to do more. They want to explore the science. They want to get close to the issues. And they now know how to swim. They know how to swim. They know how to snorkel. Some of them can dive. And some of them are already very familiar with marine science. So how do we continue now to inspire these young people to do even more? How do we inspire them to stay engaged in programs like Fish and Fins, to stay engaged with issues to do with the climate and ocean conservation? And how do we get the community rallied up to ensure that this happens so that we could be partners in providing solutions to the global issues that we all care about and that we know best from our own backyard. So why smarter tourism? Because as I said before, tourism is, is the bread and butter of the Caribbean. The Caribbean is the most tourism dependent region in the world. The problem though is many people don't have the education and awareness the ocean literacy is very low. And on top of that, we're having significant issues 
with regards to accessing financing for conservation. So this is the idea. This is the idea that I came up with when working with some, a group of consultants called Future of Fish at the uh, Interdevelopment inter inter Bank project um, to look at the blue economy for six of the larger Caribbean islands. Now, coming from my experience with it, working with Fish and Fins and my experience in tourism, I realized that we need to look at this model differently, especially since COVID hit. And so I looked at an equitable and resilient model to embed advanced science, learning, exploration, technologies, adding in some entertainment, because I know all the kids, my son for one is obsessed with video games, VR, and things like this. How can we leverage all this smart technology within the tourism industry? The vision is to reimagine tourism industry way more equitably and way more resilient so that we can bounce back stronger and bluer from issues such as financial and, and climate um, threats, like the ones we are experiencing now. Smarter tourism leverages science and technology to improve marine awareness, encourage advocacy, stewardship, and create economic opportunities. I believe we have to collaborate to accelerate the sustainable development goals, number 14, especially life below water. We need to do so for our survival as a people. So the Smarter Tourism pr um, Program is collecting underwater data and content to empower local people and to make it available to visitors. I would say it has two components. So an online portal where we upload the data the content, such as photographs, say for instance, if you all were to visit Montserrat and you all were to come to the Fish and Fins Clubhouse, you would be able to go around the island and share some of your photographs from under the sea, upload it to our online portal, come and participate in a curriculum and science, citizen science program on the back of it. So that's two parts of this actual program, the online portal and also a citizen science agenda as well. For instance, you'll be able to go and see where the turtles uh, mate, where the habitats may be. You can take your photographs, you can hang out with the fishers, and, but you can also do, do data as well, scientifically important data, the science that we need for the ocean we want this ocean decade. But what do we need to help? What do we need to see that this happens? We need financing. We need access to financing to be able to develop the business model we need to be able to provide the strategic partnerships, and we also need to be able to design low cost ocean exploration equipment that would actually give us sight in not only our near shore, but also our deep sea. Currently, I'm pleased to say that I'm testing Makanui with fisheries, fisheries and fishers on the island. Makanui is a low cost, high tech design system and it's been designed by collaborators at MIT, now Ocean Discovery League and Oceanic. In fact, just today, some testing was going on in the aquarium, which is very exciting to see. Now, what's the timeline looking like for something like smarter tourism? I think it can be achieved in quite close to five years. Immediately, I think we can be, content, we can be, we can be capturing content, underwater images, videos young people could do this as you can see we have some good divers in the fish and fins for instance uh, people in the community fishers visitors anyone who has access to a camera can upload information into an online portal in the medium term i believe we need to start to add qualifications to those who are involved in ocean conservation so within one to two years, being able to provide stackable certificates via online learning programs. Now, these could be anything from, say, for instance, a water safety to a lifeguarding certificate to something like a data anal analytics certificate or VR design certificate. And also in the long term, three to five years, a smart blue marine package or content for commercial use and content integration across health, well-being, 
and even fisheries. And quite importantly, to see smart fishers cooperatives being established in small island states like the Caribbean, focused on diversifying the impact, the, the livelihoods of our fisheries. So what does the future really look like? I think the future can look like having youth, visitors, and small businesses in the Caribbean generating a supplementary income through creative content creation and collaborative science research. Imagine being able to access the magic of the Caribbean Sea from the comfort of your own home. Imagine seeing tour operators and local tour agents being able to share innovative marketing ads for the Caribbean. I can tell you from experience, on an island like mine, you will see the hikes, you will see the trails, but you'll very rarely see anything under the sea being advertised. And most importantly too, we will get people. We need to get partnerships. We need to get more people excited. We need that human capital investment in conservation and protection of our ocean space. So I say, let's make smarter tourism a reality. Smarter tourism is a pathway to bigger opportunities for youth to dream and to actually see that their dream can manifest. They can actually decide how that dream manifests. And it also gives us an opportunity to provide a pathway for organizations and individuals like yourself to work with the Caribbean region collaboratively this ocean decade. Thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you so much, Vida, for that incredible, incredible presentation. So we have about 15 minutes for questions. We have members of the audience here in person, which is so wonderful. And then we also have people online. So we'll be fielding questions from both our in-person and our virtual. And I'll, if you're virtual, please put your um, questions in the chat on Zoom. And they'll come through to me as well. So I'll open it up. Yes. First of all, I want to say good night. Um, to everyone in here, I feel very honored and proud as a true Montserratian to sit here tonight and listen to a young lady who is much younger than myself <laughs> and who is very passionate about our Montserrat Sea. I migrated from Montserrat years back. I go home every now and again. And I went home a few weeks ago, and I bumped into Vita. And sitting, listening to her, I must tell you that our shores are going to be back with the hard work. I see in Vita and the little, we got the little canoe thing, and it's not easy going out with three, four, five, eight kids on that little canoe. And tonight, Vita, <laughs> I want to tell you that I'm going to go above and beyond, and I'm going to get you. I'm not promising you yet. But I'm going to reassure you before the year is done, I personally myself is going to get up as a true happy monstration, so proud of you, and um, I'm going to get you one of the little boats with the little engine in the back. So when you're going up with your kids, you will feel much safer. For example, if you have one of them kids out there on the little canoe and one kid feels sick, it, I know it's a hassle to go back, bring them back, go back, bring them back. It takes minutes. And on the seas, it takes two seconds for something to really go wrong. So I'm going to help you prevent that by assisting you before the year ends by getting your little boat canoe. So instead of you swimming going out 20 minutes, it will take you four or five minutes. And one other thing I must tell you, I promise Vita Ross, I can't swim and I'm on track. Believe me, I cannot swim. And Vita promised me that the next time I come back to Montreal, she's not going to just teach me to swim. She's going to help me to go and swim and get my own pool. So Vita, I want to tell you tonight, as a true, true monstration, I'm very, very proud of you. I'm happy for this invitation. And I want to tell you that the way that you're going, the stars is about. Continue to do what you're doing, and you will make not just Montserrat proud, but all our tourists who visit all the Caribbean islands proud. I thank you, Vita.
Thank you so much. Thank you so, so much. Wonderful. Yes. I've been to the Caribbean a lot. Master certified in scuba diving. And um, the beauty that's underwater, I have the honor of being able to witness. But I've also witnessed a lot of damage to the corals. And um, and it pains me to see that. And the coral system is extremely important for fisheries, for the young fish. Then you showed the, you were showing the lionfish, and uh, the lionfish are extremely damaging because they're voracious. And what the different islands are doing, like, like Bonaire or the Cayman or the Cayman Islands, they have um, scuba divers go out and spearfishing, and then they serve them in restaurants. Yep. And uh, and I've had lionfish, which is very mild tasting fish. But what is most hurtful as a scuba diver is what is happening to the corals. Seeing so many of them die off. And I, you know, in the beginning, I never really realized that the corals themselves are living organisms. At first, I thought they were just calcium, but they're living organisms, and they need to be saved, like you're saying, because if we don't have a coral system, we don't have fisheries, and that is important. Thank I'm you. Now, I'm now sick. To that, so to that point, Vita, one thing I'm not sure um, everyone may not be aware of what 1.5, when you, when you talk about the 1.5 degrees Celsius threshold, um, the significance that that bears. So maybe if you could speak to a little bit about why that's, why that's important in your, in your work and for Montserrat. Yeah, so for those of us who've been following the climate crisis, 1.5 degrees to stay alive is a sort of tagline that we've been using in the Caribbean to raise awareness and education around the impacts of, of climate change. And 1.5 degrees Celsius is what scientists are saying, we need to keep global warming below 1.5 degrees Celsius increase from pre-industrial levels. Currently, with the current emissions as they are, we're seeing that we may not hit 1.5 by 2030. And this is another reason why we're acting so urgently. And I believe that we all have to act urgently. We all need to have our own big ideas. We all need to come together and collaborate in some way to see that we can keep these global emissions down, that we can lobby politicians where necessary, and that Caribbean islands and small island states like where I am from and where my son's from and Germany and everyone else here that, that um, even have seen the beauty will realize that at 1.5, by 2030 or 2050, we're expecting to see 90% of coral reef loss. We are expecting to see climate refugees. I know what it was like to be a volcano refugee. I've actually been to the island of, Bur of Bermuda, sorry, Barbuda in Antigua next to me, where in 2017, they were hit by two category five hurricanes. And I spoke to the children of Barbuda, who, who told me of how heart-wrenching it was for them to have to evacuate their whole island. They spoke of hunger, they spoke of trauma. You know, and I don't think any child, none of us, would want this for our friends, our family, or our children. There's incredible hardship that may hit the islands if we are unable to keep warming temperatures below 1.5 degrees Celsius. So I'm hoping that you will continue to look into it, research it, and do as much as you can to lobby organizations and politicians to see that 1.5 is actually going to happen for us to stay alive. Thank you. So we have a question from our virtual audience, and that is about endangered species in the Caribbean. And um, what, if you're aware of what the most endangered species in the Caribbean is due to global warming, or if you can speak generally to endangered species in the Caribbean as a result of global warming? Yeah, because of global warming, we're seeing 
significant amounts of coral reef being being threatened. It's not one species, it's, it's coral reefs in general. We're seeing, we're expecting to see up to 90% loss if we don't reach 1.5, if we don't stay within 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, you know, fisheries, there's a tremendous amount of fish stock that could be jeopardized as well, especially those like crabs and lobsters due to ocean acidification. There's also um, turtles. And I know you have, what's the name of the turtle here again? There's a turtle. Oh, myrtle. Myrtle. In the, in the you tank. Have that green, yeah. yeah. You have this really lovely green turtle here, um, curl myr myrtle. And I'm not sure how many of us are aware, but with rising sea temperatures, then the sand that the turtles are nesting in get, gets warmer and all the eggs can end up being female. The turtles have a rough enough time as it is. I don't know, I think it's something like 1% survive. And I was even saying to my son or reminding me the other day too, of how um, we saw frigate birds come in one day to the shores of the island when some little turtles were, were, hatch, were hatching. And Ezra saw for the first time what the struggle was for these creatures. Because as soon as the turtles hit the water, Ezra was there throwing rocks, shouting, stay away, stay away. And the frigate birds came in and took every single one. So, you know, there is there is that too. And perhaps that's one of the species turtles. I mean, folks may say, oh, well, you know, how much times you want to see a turtle, but they're so majestic when you see them in the water. And it's one of those things that really connects with people because you don't have to go far to see a turtle baiting or swimming in the near shore. Um, so for those species, they're incredibly commercially significant and culturally significant to the islands. And it's another one that is it's severely under threat and critically endangered. Thank you. And we have we have a question right up here in the audience. Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, so it's really impressive that you kind of took it from the solid gas and the pathway to being able to offer that ocean education for the children and being able to provide that so they are able to fight for something and able to fight against climate change. Um, so you kind of alluded to starting with not really having that skill set or that education behind you. So if you're just seeing something that done and just kind of figuring it out along the way and then kind of now being here and being able to have something really successful and being able to see that difference in the kids. Um, so my question is, looking back on it, is there anything now in the position you're in that you're being able to tell yourself when you first started? So the, I'll just repeat for the audience so the our folks that are vir virtual can hear. And the question is, looking back on it, is there anything that you wish that you can you repeat your question? Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, if there's anything now being in the position, having this successful program, what would you tell kind of your younger self starting off um, to kind of be able to provide the success that you have? So what would you tell your younger self <laughs> to be able to have the success that you have now? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I think if I could go back and tell my younger self something, it would be to focus more on the sustainability. It's all good and well to create a program that is accessible, that's cross-pollinating, and is getting the job done. People are getting exciting, excited, but how are you really going to sustain it? What are the income streams? Where are the partners? Who are the partners? And building a strong business case for its longevity. And I think that's, that's what it is. I think it's maybe thinking a little bit harder on the cash flow, because it gets really stressful when you don't have the money to do the good work and you don't have the partners. Because as I said here, Wait Institute were on the island when I started. When Wait Institute left the island because the program wasn't, the program wasn't, um, the marine spatial plan wasn't being accepted by government, so they left. So our biggest science partner, not necessarily financial partner, but it was good to have an international organization there to kind of back you up and do things together collaboratively. So when they left, it became an immense struggle. Very traumatic, very stressful. And 
I actually was angry. I felt traumatized <laughs> by the whole situation, to be very honest with you. And, um, but then if you get the chance, you can read this white paper that I wrote because I thought, what am, what am I gonna do? Stop spitting fire or am I gonna come up with a solution? And I came up with this framework for the Caribbean blue economy as to how we can work more collaboratively with interna for international NGOs and small island grassroots organizations like my own. And in there, I've written some of the lessons that I think would be useful for us all to know in terms of how to build long-term relationships with organizations like myself. So you could check it out. It's like $5.99 on Amazon. And um, it's, it's, um, it's, it's probably a good read in answering that as well, because those lessons I've documented. Great, so our next question is coming in from the virtual chat, and that has to do with what other um, countries in the Caribbean are you working with as you um, carry out your, your new vision that you presented to us? And I'll add on a kind of a secondary question to that, the, the barriers and opportunities that you're facing in that process. Okay, so um, at the moment in the Caribbean, I'm working with the island of Barbados, and we're working on a project called Digifish, which is providing fishers with vessel monitoring services so that they can actually track through data how their fishing efforts, so how far from shore they have to go, during what seasons. We're able over time to start to track how much um, climate change might be affecting the fisheries. But what's most important is that we're able to help modernize or begin to modernize fisheries. So we have a pilot of about 30 to 35 fishers in Barbuda, and those fishers are now getting more familiar with the technology. And some of them are young fishers, some of them are older, but they are now looking and very excited to see where their um, where they're fishing most efficiently and to be able to see like an app like this or not even an app but a device like this is able to help them fish more efficiently um now this is very useful because if we are to realize something like smart smarter tourism we need to get ordinary folks of the caribbean much more technologically savvy for us in the caribbean Innovation is not a luxury, it's an absolute must. Thank you. And we have time for one more question. Yes, right there. Hello. <laughs> Wonderful. So, 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 so very proud of you. So Thank very you. proud of you. It's an honor to be here, to, to hear you. The one question, collaboration and sustainability is key with any business to exist, to expand, and to grow. So are there any particular business categories that uh, would help support fish and fins, global warming, build awareness as to what needs to be done? Different categories. You mentioned technology. Uh, which is very important. So, you know, we have, whether or not it, it's YouTube or, uh, we have so much technology, but they might not focus, not even YouTube, but uh, Microsoft, uh, but are they focusing on the area that you're trying to build? So is there any particular technology or businesses that uh, can go after to get resources to develop what you want. Great question. Thank you so much. And I'm so honored that you've come tonight. Oh, I'm so happy. I'm so happy too. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, I love you. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're gonna make me cry. Um, okay, so organizations who are potential collaborators. And for, I'll speak specifically for Smarter Tourism. And um, when we were sort of developing this um this approach this model uh effort was made to speak to um global travel agents around the time of covid and those global travel agents 
are interested in receiving and accessing um, innovative content for marketing purposes to targeted audiences. So they're one. We also spoke to um, VR companies, virtual reality designers, who would be interested in helping to educate, um, build the skill capacity necessary for young people to get the skills required to be able to convert what they're capturing underwater and making it into a more immersive environment. I'm constantly working in the background to build relationships and networks with organizations. And the MIT group, I big ups to the MIT group. Maybe somebody is from the MIT here. Oh, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny Chow is from MIT. And um, so yeah, it's just working with really great um, people because I was meeting one of the team today and they were met talking about a hackathon they had. And in the hackathon, they came up with this idea where you can actually feel what fish feel underwater. And so I'm thinking things like this would be really great content for a tourism um, product within a Fish and Fins clubhouse on Montserrat or any other Caribbean islands. And then, of course, ocean education organizations and international um, NGOs, they always need the data or they need the content. And especially now where a lot of people are educating virtually, including my own son, um, it would be it's we, we're, we're getting a good vibe that they would be interested in partnering in the content to help um, education. So linking with us in the Caribbean, um, even say for instance, New, New England Aquarium could do the same thing, um, is once people are here, they can actually contact us and or get footage and stories and science and data and be able to exhibit that here um, where people in the Caribbean could be paid to capture that information and to be recognized in an, in an organization such as this. So the work has begun. A lot of it has happened unpaid and without partnerships, but that's never stopped me before, so I don't expect it to stop me now. <laughs> um, and, but we do need the access to finance so that we can have a proper um, assessment, feasibility study done, um, business planning and strategic partnerships decided and so on. So we can actually do the work of the sustainability and the finance behind the idea as opposed to just going at it. Wonderful. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful note to end on is <laughs> finance and sustainability to yeah. make sure you can keep doing the good work. So yeah. thank you, Vita, for sharing your story and your vision. And thank you for everyone for coming tonight. We will have, um, this event was made possible with the generous support from the Lowell Institute, which allows the aquarium to offer these events free of charge. And we're, we're very grateful to have their support. If you enjoyed this program and want to help support our ocean education and conservation work, please consider a contribution to the New England Aquarium at neaq.org. And next, we look forward to diving underneath the surface to continue our lecture series with acclaimed underwater photographer, Keith Ellenbogen. More information to come on that lecture. Thank you all. It was so wonderful to have both the in-person audience and our virtual audience. And for those of you that are here in person, there is a cash bar that will be open for another half hour if you'd like to stay and chat with Vida. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. It's been my absolute pleasure.